I have the pleasure to uh, present today uh, Bonnie Burnham, who is the president of the Cultural Heritage Finance Alliance and president emeritus of World Monuments Fund. She led the World Monument Fund from 18, uh, 1985 when she joined the organization as executive director. And through November 2015, during uh, which time the World Monument Fund, through November 2015, during which time the World uh, Monument Fund orchestrated and supported more than 600 heritage conservation projects around the world. In 2019, together with a group of colleagues, she founded the Cultural Heritage Finance Alliance an organization that promotes financing strategies for heritage preservation in the context of sustainable development. Welcome, uh, Bonnie, to uh, our first webinar. And we are very pleased to hear from you about the creative community as a harbinger of urban generation. Thank you very much, Ruba. So okay. thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. As Ruba has has uh, already said, I've been in the cultural heritage field for many years, uh, uh, working specifically uh, within the context of the built environment. And I know that many people uh, here are from more from arts institutions and cultural institutions. Uh, and it's interesting that there it seems to be sometimes a divide between those of us working with heritage from the viewpoint of, of buildings and um, urban spaces and those who are running institutions within those spaces. Uh, and, and I hope that this can uh, kind of close some of those gaps uh, in, in the course of this presentation. I'm starting with a little background going back to 2015, which was a seminal year in this discussion about the role of cultural heritage in society and in relation to sustainable development. Because of the uh, the updating of the Sustainable Development Goals, which had initially uh, been selected in uh, 2000 at the time of the millennium. Uh, many of us were on board at the time of the millennium with the hope of getting culture adopted as a fourth pillar of uh, development. And that, that uh, effort was not successful, but in the meantime, the, the heritage sector has done a huge amount of work uh, to position culture and to think about its uh, values, how, to, how culture is valued and the role that it plays in society. And I think that that whole discussion is summarized in this image, uh, which comes from the Cultural Heritage Counts for Europe report that was sponsored by the EU, in which uh, many European institutions participated. We'd come to realize that culture is a driver of development, but sometimes it's uh, seen as, from the economic perspective, an upstream driver so that culture, cultural events happen, cultural institutions exist, uh, culture exists in um, our built environment context, and it creates these uh, impacts that can be measured, economic and social and cultural impact, but it doesn't always benefit directly from those impacts or um, be seen as a participatory member of the development process. And so uh, the idea of the um, Culture Counts program was to mainstream culture as an economic and uh, development player. And I think that uh, summarizes what we're, what we're all uh, grappling with and trying to achieve today. And uh, the when the Sustainable Development Goals were uh, adopted in 2015, again, a certain amount of dismay from people in the cultural sector that there wasn't one single goal associated with our mission. But on the other hand, culture permeates uh, many of the sustainable, uh, sustainable development initiatives and objectives uh, over time. And uh, maybe we're better off uh, that we're embracing so many uh, different sectors of, uh, of human development, sustainable development, uh, as they are articulated through these goals. Uh, this image summarizes um, an approach to integrating culture with sustainable development that's been adopted 
by a program called Patrimonio Vivo or Living Heritage at the Inter-American Development Bank. And I happen to be working with them on a report. And I'm giving you some a little bit of, of a uh, anticipation of uh, what's uh, the, the main thrust of this of this initiative. Uh, today, the report will be delivered in about two weeks' time uh, um, to the Inter-American Development Bank, and then we'll see how they uh, take it from there. But uh, they've identified five pillars of uh, sustainable development, which align with many of the goals that we're trying to achieve in order to stabilize environmental circumstances in, in our cities, and particularly uh, the evolution of culture as part of, part of this um, change toward integrated planning for the future of the planet. So uh, what uh, my new organization, Chifa, was asked to do by the Inter-American Development Bank was to develop a methodology that could be applied uh, to cities uh, across uh, the region in order to help bring them into, uh, help bring not only uh, culture into the mix of sustainable development, but to create link linkages between the public and the private sector. Uh, big institutions uh, across the world tend to be involved only with the public sector and with properties and with public sector pro partners and with properties largely that are in the public domain and for public use, uh, leaving a huge amount of the heritage uh, designated sites, designated districts, and areas where culture plays a big role in, um, in urban life uh, without any uh, resources. So our goal is to create a methodology for integration between public and private uh, engagement with, with sustainable development, which is catalyzed by uh, institutions like the Inter-American Development Bank or the um, European Union uh, but without the explicit intention of engaging the private sector. And we came up with a four-point methodology beginning, uh, which is a kind of standard uh, planning and implementation methodology, but spoke, focused explicitly on an overlay for urban development plans that brings uh, the private sector into the same sphere as the public sector in terms of developing a vision and strategy, applying that to the entire framework uh, of our planning area, uh, creating a financial model for integration between public and private sector, and a management structure that can orchestrate those things. And, and that's more or less summarized in, in, in this slide that all this anticipating the moment of implementation of any projects in order to uh, bring uh, public and private into alignment. And this captures the idea of expanding on the funding pool that's available uh, not only for urban regeneration, but for the financing of cultural projects, which typically, uh, typically limit themselves or define themselves in terms of resources that are available from the public sector and resources that are available from the philanthropic sector. And so looking at these other uh, forms of investment and forms of capital has typically been outside the mandate of nonprofit institutions uh, that have been, uh, you could say siloed, or you could say focused on working within a milieu that's a very comfortable milieu for all of us, uh, but rarely interacts with uh, profit making uh, uh, financial sector. And so these uh, layers of financing, which are often referred to in financial sectors as a capital stack, uh, I have um, characterized as a pool. And I think that the critical element to uh, focus on here is the venture capital pool and the uh, kind of um, yellowish orange band that uh, it brings some capital into the marketplace in order to position cultural projects so that they would then uh, align with other forms of financing, such as impact investment capital. 
and even uh, senior investment, which means uh, people in the marketplace looking for a market level return. And so that's the that's the crux of the financial argument in this in this thesis. Uh, I think the other uh, critical piece is some is uh, an innovative management structure for this um, orchestration of the relationship between the public and the private sector. Um, many cultural institutions are used to raising money. Uh, they're used to raising money through fairly orthodox established vehicles like uh, writing grants, grant proposals, and uh, relying on certain kinds of public sector sub subsidies. But there is, as you begin to enter into a wider um, financial and capital environment, there are many other forms of outreach, uh, of compliance, of, um, of uh, investor expectations to be met, of risk mitigation that become part of the process of management. And I suspect that most institutions are not really in a position of readiness to take on this management uh, role. And it may be uh, that there's a solution, and I think there's not a solution that's really been invented. There are uh, a range of management structures from public-private partnerships to public management agencies to uh, nonprofit management agencies that uh, have been brought into existence in recent times in order to manage uh, integrated financing projects. Uh, but each one is uh, made to suit the local environment, and it may be that a single model emerges. Uh, but I think in general, I, uh, in, in order to achieve uh, market, uh, to, to reach a marketplace that's broader than the one that our sector has had access to in the past, Institutions may need to pool their projects and work together uh, toward unified toward a unified goal, and I'll give you an example of that shortly. But I think that the uh, the uh, cro the bridging uh, resource might be uh, a revolving fund comparable to the kinds of revolving funds that exist in many many places, uh, particularly in the UK where the Architectural Heritage Fund has had a long uh, record of financing the startup of, of new uh, cultural institutions and trusts that then take responsibility for heritage properties, or the one in uh, the famous one in Netherlands that provides seed funding. And so this is a uh, circular framework that ultimately provides the startup resources that allows institutions uh, to develop the planning and early stage project work that will allow them to bring their projects to a broader marketplace. So I want to make two concrete examples where I think that the cultural sector is reaching beyond uh, the, the, the traditional resources that it had in order to uh, become players in this sustainable development marketplace uh, that is being created uh, as we speak. One that took place in New York just a year or two ago, uh, there is a very well-known social service institution uh, in the United States called LISC, L-I-S-C, which is a specialist in providing um, short-term financing, the same kind of catalytic startup financing that I just referred to for sustainable housing. Uh, across the United States, there are many, many branches of it. But LISC has within its mandate uh, the, the, the uh, mission goal of placemaking. And so in New York City, they decided to enter in, uh, with, in partnership with another organization into the creation of an inclusive creative economy fund which had it initially as its um, objective the financing of four projects that were the projects of different cultural institutions in the city. Uh, one, the one that you're looking at on the uh, cover of this report from LISC is uh, an annex that was created by, a, a, by an experimental theater company called La Mama that wanted to, in order to uh, expand upon its um, audience base, uh, 
uh, in, engage in educational activities for children and in um, uh, being able to attract a more inclusive audience. And so they uh, acquired and renovated a new facility uh, in order to, uh, to do that. The financing, capital financing for it came from a pool of investors through LISC. And so this, for, for the first time um, in my immediate environment, is an example of a cultural institution reaching out to the financial marketplace and uh, with the expectation that over time, the new activity that will be generated in this facility will uh, pay, for, pay back the investors. And the other projects in the um, in that pool were very diverse, including um, uh, a facility for artists working spaces for craftsmen and so forth. But in the interest of time, I want to move on to my last example, which is something in the making, uh, which is a cultural facility as a hub and as a catalyst for urban regeneration in the Zanzibar Stone Town in Africa. Zanzibar is a, uh, the whole stone town is a designated world heritage site. It's in a uh, condition of, of enormous uh, decay and disinvestment. And so uh, as a harbinger for new development, the, the title of the theme of my talk, uh, an organization that's in called Stadsverstel Amsterdam, the famous uh, cultural uh, property management institution has been created in Zanzibar. And this project is to renovate a movie theater as the home of several cultural institutions, including uh, a film festival organization, a music festival organization, a women's workspace organization, and itself. And they're looking to the marketplace, uh, the traditional financial marketplace, rather than the philanthropic and governmental sources of support. Uh, they've been given the building by the Zanzibar government. And so they're just at the crux of beginning this process of cre uh, creating something that can be both, pro uh, that can be a hybrid, both for-profit and non-profit, uh, that can uh, host organizations that are uh, serving in the community in in interests that can be the uh, show place for cultural activities and festivals. And then, and then as an economic generating activity and when all these other things are not happening, show movies in order to uh, sustain itself. So I'm going to end my talk there and I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk to this business oriented uh, institution. I look forward to the other presentations.